So welcome to our masterclass here at the Permaculture Education Institute. I know that some of you have been to many of our masterclasses before, um, but there's also many of you who've never, ever been to anything that we've run before. So let me just give you a little bit of an introduction. Um, my name is Maura Gamble, and I'm the host of the Permaculture Education Institute. So the Permaculture Education Institute uh, operates on six continents. We train permaculture teachers around the world, but we are based here at a permaculture village in southeast Queensland, a place called Crystal Waters. Now, tonight is a different kind of masterclass. It's a conversational masterclass uh, exploring the topic of permaculture and unschooling. Now, like our unschooling journey, this has been quite a responsive type of topic. Now, the idea of permaculture unschooling came out of uh, a post that I put out on social media just recently, actually, when I was taking Maya, my daughter, down to Canberra to begin her first year of university at ANU. And we, we were talking about how, what did it take for an unschooled young woman to get to ANU, which is Australia's number one university at the age of 16. How does that even work? You know, we have this notion in our general thinking, our general culture says that you must finish year 11 and 12 to be able to get into university. And that is the pathway. And I know so many young people who that either doesn't fit or it makes their lives absolutely intolerable. And some people just want more, just want way much more than that. And so I guess what we thought we would do here is open that conversation a bit and to share our journey, our story, and to open to questions. So I'd like to introduce you to Maya here and also to Stacey. Stacey is um, our, our community manager at the Permaculture Education Institute. And uh, so if you ever need any help behind the scenes with anything, Stacey's always the one there to talk to. And if you need any help tonight, please find her in the participant list and you can um, ask her for support as well. Um, but coming back to Maya, so uh, Maya is 16. She's now studying at the Australian National University. I'll let her introduce yeah. herself a little bit more, but essentially she has grown up in a permaculture way of life. I've been a permaculture teacher for, oh, I don't know, 30 years or so. And so that's been her reality of growing up and it's really only in reflection that we're starting to have these conversations it's just, it was just normal for you wasn't it Maya being being in a sling being you know helping me teach permaculture courses or you know traveling to Seoul and helping me teach courses over there or having permaculture camps coming and you leading programs like it was just kind of what you did and it's what we did as a family and and it's on problem reflection how much of a an amazing exploration that was of learning of all different sorts, learning in context, learning design and thinking and philosophy and, and all of those things together that created a really interesting frame for learning. So welcome, Maya. Thank you for joining me here. Thank you for accepting my invitation to join me on this masterclass. It was a very special number 50 masterclass. <laughs> That's impressive, the amount of masterclasses you've done. I remember when you were first starting. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's, it's been kind of interesting in the last few months because after moving out, it's finally, it's it's dawning on me a little bit more that how I grew up and how I started learning about things and my way of life is a lot different to everyone else's, like growing up in an eco village, you know, moving into homeschooling and unschooling and traveling around the world teaching permaculture courses most people don't even know what permaculture is here so it's really interesting to see you know before I couldn't articulate it but now that I'm having to explain it to everyone it's getting a little bit easier yeah I think when I visited you recently I think something that really struck me was when you said I feel feels a bit weird being so disconnected from my food system uh you know I think that perhaps you know there's there's something in that and uh and maybe I hope that you find a way to to reconnect with your food system down there in one way or another mm. so so let's um let's begin um I, I've 
First, would like to acknowledge, though, that I'm calling in here from the unceded lands of the Gabi Gabi and pay my deep respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And I would like to also acknowledge everyone that's ever been part of um, the supporting of the work that we've done and all of the young children that you've brought along on those journeys with you. Uh, I think it's such an important thing to do, like being a parent or a mother or a father or a carer who's bringing children into the world with an understanding of this sort of deeply resilient and robust and sustainable way of living and, and not necessarily having to teach about it, but creating a context where that learning just kind of seeps into, into their cells, into their bones, into their thoughts, and, and that the conversations and questions help to shape this. But anyway, Mike, tell us a little bit first about, like, let's start in the present, and then we can kind of work our way back. Where, tell us a little bit more about where you are now, what you're doing, and what made you decide to do, take this particular path. Yeah, so currently I'm studying at the Australian National Uni and I'm doing a Bachelor of Politics, Philosophy and Economics. Um, so I decided to do this because inherently I'm a generalist. I cannot pick one degree. So I decided to do the one that had three in one. And um, something that kind of, that was about how people think, but also how to make direct kind of change and you know always what I've heard is that with all these projects going around with perm youth and with all these different projects I've seen around the world they say we're doing great things but we need it to be heard and we kind of need policy to go through to help it get bigger and more seen so I thought what better way to do that than to do politics and it seemed that economics was good to fit in there because then the people who are making policy will probably take me more seriously. But yeah, so I, I decided to just try, you know, I wasn't expecting to get in honestly, but now that I have, I wasn't really coming in with that many expectations because I'd, I'd never moved before. Um, I'd done some uni subjects, but they were online. So it was kind of just throwing myself into a whole new experience, but I knew that I'd try and get everything I, out of it I could and to bring the permaculture mindset and pretty much everything I'd learned into it now. So now I've become like co-convener of the Environment Committee already and gone to climate strikes down here, which is really nice because there's a pretty big climate movement down here. And I one, one time when I went to Canberra quite a few years ago, I was stunned by like the design of it and just how how conscious everyone was of all the issues around. So I thought I'd really love to get deeper into that. And yeah, so that's kind of how I found my way here. <laughs> yeah. And also um, from day one, too, you were a uh, volunteer at the local food co-op as well, which, yeah. You know, so that's a way of connecting with your food system. Mm. No, <laughs> food co-ops are amazing places. And I think it's kind of more home for me in the food co-op because in Mulaney, that's kind of, you know, where we usually got our food. So just connecting back to that system, I think has been a really good thing to do. And also learning how food co-ops work, getting really more involved in them has been really interesting. Yeah, I guess too. And as a uni student, being able to access affordable, good food is important because yeah. <laughs> I know that, um, you know, uni students normally run on the smell of an oily rag. And when you join the local food co-op, you can actually get, was it 20% off all you your volunteer. food yep. when you volunteer and also when you volunteer at lunchtime, you get a free lunch and there's mm. really great take-home packs of organic food. And so, you know, part of your education to other students is that this exists. A lot of people don't even know that the food co-op exists right on the edge of the campus either, do they? I think I've single-handedly promoted the co-op to the whole of the campus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's that's great. And, and I think just on that, the thing about the top, you've done a lot of study over the years. We've worked together, Maya and I have worked together with um, Fruchoff Capra, who's a systems thinker, and both of us have hosted um, a youth cohort through his program for many years. So if any one of you who are interested in, uh, if you're between sort of the ages of sort of 15 to 18 or so, and would like to be part of a future cohort of, of studying with Fruchoff Capra, um, 
actually I have his book here. I always have it handy. This is his um, Cambridge University Press textbook, The Systems View of Life. And it, I have another one of his books I took to camera. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the one she stole from my library, by the way. <laughs> Um, so we have we have this ongoing relationship with this systems thinker and connect young people with him. And one of the things I think what he said often, and it's what you were alluding to before, that we have all the solutions that we need in the world. We need the political will. And you can translate that in many different ways. You could translate that as, as needing the will of the people, the political will. And that's mm. that thing of having campaigns and getting people out, being active, you know, through the environment, at the same time as having change in policy. And so I think you're working on all those different spectrums. And I think that's, you know, being active, being engaged and finding a voice. And I, I think one of the things that was really interesting um, of you finding a voice is, is perma-youth. I wonder mm. if you could just mention a bit about what is perma-youth what it has done and maybe what it's meant for you in your learning journey. Yeah, yeah. So I think Perma Youth was, it kind of emerged when I just started homeschooling again after leaving um, a private school that I got full scholarship to um, for year 10. So I was like... Hang on, well, let's just, just stop there. For okay, a <laughs> sorry. So um, <laughs> you, firstly, the one thing I want to pick up is you said homeschooling. So what is your differentiation between homeschooling and unschooling, just to be clear yeah, for everyone yeah, yeah. here? So, um, I mean, I've kind of, it's become habit to say homeschooling because when you say unschooling, it kind of gets a bit of a blank look. Um, but what I see as homeschooling and unschooling, homeschooling is kind of doing school at home in being taught by parents or a tutor and kind of following a, a curriculum of some sort. It can be any different curriculum from Steiner to the Australian school curriculum. Um, but yeah, following that and doing it in some way that is accessible for you. And then unschooling, I find, at least for me, is after you've gone to school the first time and you go, actually, no, I'm going to learn this all again and shape it to kind of, you know, for me, fitting into the permaculture world and yeah just a whole different paradigm of learning so yeah. I think also as part of your unschooling journey I had to unschool as well I mean I went through a very standard upbringing I went to the local primary school that was down the road and then to go to high school I would hop on my bike and go off to the local high school and then I went to the local university that was just a train ride away and my schooling was very conventional in that way and so I, I hadn't come at, into parenthood thinking okay, I'm going to unschool my children. It just had not dawned upon me. It wasn't actually until I noticed changes in you at school, you kind of, like, like if I use a flower, it's just kind of you started to close up a bit as a flower, like you would disappear maybe under the table. In, at times. Oh, I got so bored I fell asleep under the table once, I think. <laughs> but... Um... Yeah. And so I would notice this because I would go in and be helping out as a parent in the schools and all things. And I would notice that and I would keep asking you how things going. And and then I would see what you're doing outside of school and what you're doing inside of school. And I don't know why or how you decided to leave school the first time. It was never it was not a it wasn't a sort of a anything that I'd planned. It mm. it emerged from a response to you as a child. Yeah. Noticing. It was it was interesting because I'd gone into primary school <laughs> thinking I'm going to only go to two schools in my life. I'm going to go to primary school all the way and high school all the way. <laughs> um, but in year five, I just was like, I hate my teacher. <laughs> um, I'm curious, what is this homeschooling thing that my mother has mentioned once? <laughs> so uh, over the holidays, I just kind of stopped going back to school and then started learning about I think the first thing I dove into was Roman numerals <laughs> and um, I just completely followed my own interests and it was really good and then in year eight uh, oh, I in during that time I went to something called extension education and you know you brought me to a whole lot of different workshops permaculture and like just writing workshops and just 
all these different ex extracurricular things, as many as we could find. I almost had something on every single day that was outside. And um, it was it was just really interesting to see, oh, it, school isn't just in schooling, like you can learn outside of school. And um, just seeing how really into all the other homeschool kids were. And then in year eight, I decided to go back to school to just, I was curious again to see the high school system. So I went back for that. And then I realized, you know, it'd be fun to try and get into a, a private school <laughs> just to see. So I um, applied for that and I ended up getting a full scholarship. So I thought, yeah, okay, I'll try that out. So I decided to go for a year and try and see what that system was like. And I feel like school was very disciplinary. You, if you started writing about English and geography, you would get marked down for adding in things from other subjects. And that just wasn't the way how I thought. It was just all meshed together and like, science is doing that over here, geography is doing that. They're not connecting, even though they're exact same thing. So I got a little bit sick of that. And I wanted to choose my own mentors, choose the own topics I did. So I kind of moved out of that again into what I knew how to do, which was unschooling. And then I guess here the story merges back into Permeet because that emerged at the same time. All right. So thank you, Maya, for uh, filling in those gaps. So it's been quite a journey of being in and out of school, um, different reasons for going in and out, curiosity, always following it. And on my part, you know, I've just tried to stay flexible and open and trust the process um, because I, I've always watched Maya and, and really noticed where her energy is or where I, you know, the most important thing for me as a parent is noticing when I see her eyes sparkle and when I see them start to cloud over. And, you know, as a parent, you would know that look, um, I'm sure you do. And so whenever I would notice the spark come back or some ignite, you know, igniting spark there, that's where I would kind of add more fuel. Or if you do a garden metaphor, I, you know, I'd see some sprout of inspiration, I'd add more compost, you know. And that's kind of our, that's been my approach of, as an unschooling parent. Mm. And so um, we went off to climate marches after actually going to Fintorn first. Maybe you want to tell the story of our journey to Findhorn. Yeah, so in 2019, um, we went traveling the world again. <laughs> so um, in the year before that, we'd gone to Africa, but um, we'll go into that later. But Findhorn um, was a climate conference. And um, as part of that, um, there was a youth group in it. And so this was, I was 12 at the time. But the, I'm just going to interject there, Maya, because something that I had to do as a parent all the time through homeschooling is advocate for Maya to be accepted into places. Like, so for example, that climate conference it was really for 15 years and over. And so yeah. I was on the blow all the time saying, oh, I've got this, you know, really interested young and she's, you know, this and she's that and can we come along and I'll be there. And, and so uh, I think that's a really, that was sort of part of me seeing the spark and advocating and as a as an unschooling parent I think that's been one of the biggest roles that I've been able to play is to be an advocate for for Maya. Mm. Yeah because I was, was going to say it was it was a very much older crowd but the thing is they were really interested and they understood everything and I'm like oh I found my people they understand what permaculture is <laughs> so I was hanging out with all these like people that were finishing high school almost and into uni already and we were listening to these speakers like Charles Eisenstein, uh, Shooters Carl Martinez. Um, Vandana Shiva was Vandana there. Vandana Shiva, yeah, it was an amazing conference. And it just kind of opened my eyes to see that this was happening all around the world and that it was really happening, like, seriously. And, you know, it was... And the amount of people, like, there was people, the tribes from the Amazon rainforest, Eskimo tribes, it was like everyone was coming together and yeah that was kind of my observing phase that was like principle one <laughs> go and observe what was happening and I didn't particularly interact too much in the general conversations but I learned so much from that 
So when I came back into the school, I tried to advocate for that. I went on radio shows, I wrote articles for newsletters and everything. Um, and I think part of the reason why I left is that it wasn't really being picked up as I hoped it would. So, yeah. Yeah, I, another thing that happened on that trip was you ended up being inside the halls of Westminster the oh, day yes. that <laughs> the first um, declaration of a climate emergency was happening. Do you want to talk about that yeah. and how that influenced maybe possibly you heading towards a politics degree? Yeah, so... Um... We were walking through the halls of Westminster and the person that was with us, um, a, a lord of some sort, was it? Yeah, he pointed in there and he was like, oh yes, we will be doing the climate emergency bill. They're just in that room now. <laughs> and it was just kind of like, whoa, it's happening. We've been talking about this for years and it's finally happening. And I was like, oh, I wish this could happen in Australia, um, which at that point, um, didn't really look like it was on the cards. So I thought I have to do something about this. Um, and just having that opportunity to actually, you know, have time and the energy to do that project of Home Youth, which was kind of how it emerged for me. Mm. Just, just, probably... just on that too, that I think when we asked why and how it got to be that this declaration was being made in England, they it pointed out the window it was, yeah. the young people. Mm. And and that, I, you know, again, that was one of those moments when I saw you go, well, if they could do it here, <laughs> it's possible. You know, it's that, it's that lens of possibility and that, that you have agency. You don't have to be over 18 and adult, fully graduated to have Able agency. To vote or, you know, have a job or, you know, you can do it any time. Yeah. And so... Yeah. And so so then yeah, landing back in Australia, we started to go to climate strikes and things. Mm. And then Yeah, sorry, through, and then time. COVID came along and knocked that kind of to the ground with all the strikes outdoors. And as much as I love the climate strikes, um, it seemed that it was not it wasn't it was very like we're against this. And I was like what do we want to fight for? Like, we don't want no new coal and gas. Yes. But what What after that? So I, we were thinking, and so part of uh, me and a few other people who were doing the Permaculture Educators Program, we got together and started discussing, you know, permaculture and how we could try and make something of this and bring together our energies that we were like, well, we don't have anything to do with the climate movement now. How can we do this? every day not just when we go to strikes um and kind of weave permaculture and what we know into it so it then it mycelated into a global movement with refugees coming in um connections with people that we'd met in africa um and then you know people from all over the globe start to get involved and you know we supported music studios being built in these refugee settlements we did camps and we made gardens and just generally got out the awareness that it is possible to make action through permaculture doing practical meaningful activism and it got really noticed and so it was kind of like yeah I can make a difference <laughs> so hmm yeah, and also and just the organisational skills of being able to write a newsletter, do graphic design, send out little reminder emails on time, <laughs> like every little thing. And I think part of my education at that point was that project-based learning is really important, but individually, um, I think it's, for me, I found it was much more um beneficial to do it as a community you learn with other people not just learning it with someone so then you can kind of show it to other people but creating it together and especially when you're homeschooled and you live in an eco village it's kind of hard to kind of meet up with people when you're so far away so having that online space and doing those online projects with people really actually brought it together nicely so yeah yeah so there's a lot of different things that are 
that come up through that. And I think um, the Perma Youth, you know, as you're saying, offered a platform for you to learn lots of skills. And, you know, I have to say that Maya has developed some pretty awesome graphic design skills and she's now does a lot of graphic design for me and she's just done a graphic design for a big banner that's gone out to um, a refugee settlement in Tanzania for their next permaculture design course and did their logo for them. So all these things she's able to do both as a contributor to our charity but also to our work and also to any work that she's doing in her, in her world as well. But um, there's also the festivals and the podcasts and the YouTubes mm. and the events and maybe talk a little bit about the festivals that you hosted for for a couple of years and and I hope that we'll be able to reinstate them in a little while too maybe in a different form maybe with some new um, people who want to kind of step up as leaders in this too I mean that would yeah. be amazing you know let us know if you have young people who you think would like to do that this is part of the process that the doors are open and we really would love for people to um, step in hmm. yeah so the festivals were a really interesting place because I got to like directly meet and interview these amazing people from around the world like Sierra Robinson an activist from the US um Costa Georgiadis amazing he's so cool um and Hannah Maloney Hugh Richards and we talked to them about permaculture but also how did they get there how did they do what they do and kind of what keeps them going and I think just there was these little bits of insights that keep coming into my head every now and again. And I'm like, oh, where was that from? And I'm like, oh, that was Hugh Richards. <laughs> it's just, and it's kind of like one of the things I remember really strongly was um, Charlie McGee. And it said, the world needs people who have come alive. So find what you love and go do it. <laughs> so he, he found music. And so he makes all these cool permaculture albums. And I love philosophy so I'm trying to figure out how I can make that into something that can help and yeah no, it was just really interesting to see insights from people that had already gone through that process and I think just talking to people was really good and also seeing other people getting involved and giving that space to you know other people my age from other eco villages other refugee settlements and also making a space for music to come out of that slam poetry to come out films and art and everything so yeah you know I think it's what's really interesting about that is what perma youth was able to do to really bring culture into permaculture in a very mm. direct and visible way you know like you're saying there was permaculture music just flourishing out of that it's art and um, you know all kinds of things that were going on you ran workshops like photography workshops and had a photography a global photography perma youth um, mm. sort of competition in a I don't know if it was a competition but it was a it was an exhibition that you pulled together it was a you know like a, a global online exhibition mm. and every time you ran one of those festivals too like what we're doing today with this masterclass. Um, anyone who donated, and thank you for donating, um, today we were able to raise um, $813 that we're sending 100% to the Refugee Perma Youth programs. Mm. Every time that one of the festivals was hosted by the Perma Youth, um, any donations, they're always free, but anyone who feels that they can donate, the money goes 100%. And so the money that you were able to raise through that was in the thousands through free Perma Youth events. It's mm. phenomenal. Uh, so there's so there's that side of connecting young people with um, global global issues that I think is really important. And then the the podcast, and then you got picked up by a radio show. So you had a radio show hosted um, that had a patron that was Dame Jane Goodall. And so I think what what you kind of see is that by just I don't know. I think it's that thing of just saying yes. Because people come and tap you on the shoulder. That's, Would you that's like all to I've ever done. <laughs> it's just so yes to everything. Yeah. And yeah, I feel like one of the things that really helped along the way was defining what permaculture meant for us. Like we had the framework of the principles, we had the framework of the ethics, and we went, we love gardening. Unfortunately, we live all around the world, so we can't get together and make a garden together, which is what the hubs in the local areas doing stuff in our communities really helped. But when we're online, we use these principles to kind of shape how we were learning. And I think 
it's kind of always been really natural to me because you know I've seen them around they haven't really been named when I've been learning them but all these different concepts were there and so it was kind of learning that they were there that was part of the process and seeing oh yeah no this 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 works in an education space too it's it's using nature as a metaphor for other things because all these principles come directly from like just observing <laughs> observing nature you know using indigenous knowledge and just kind of the movements that were happening around that when Bill Mollison was around and so it's been really interesting to see how they've kind of evolved from that and I think that's really helped kind of give me a framework to view how I see my learning process through it all. Mm. Yeah, when I was talking to you earlier today, when we were chatting about some of the questions we might bring up today, and I asked you about what you see as um, home, homeschooling, unschooling, and one of the things that you said to me was, I see unschooling just as learning. Like, yeah. You know, I often mean, we have all these labels for things and everyone kind of gets stuck on the labels, whether they mean this or that. And yeah. And it was just really refreshing when you said that I was like oh of course that's what it is it's <laughs> it's responsive learning it's learning following your curiosity it's learning I mean that, you uh, learn yeah. everywhere doing everything whether it's good learning or bad learning <laughs> it always happens um one of Fritjof's kind of main ideas which I really love is that to live is to know you know you're constantly learning throughout everything and I think that just by allowing space for that to happen, the conversations and the discussions, it's just, that's, that's what you need to kind of learn. <laughs> so. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And even, you know, he, t he teaches in the, in the systems of life course about how, you know, one of the basic things of life at, a, at the very cellular level is that life is a learning system. And uh, so learning is the basis of, of everything. I, I, I don't know if you remember terribly much, but you've, you've always been learning in a permaculture context, whether we called it that or not. For example, when you were, when, when you were really little, I started up this thing called the Carousel Kids program. It was here at the Eco Village. There was quite a few mums who had little kids and there wasn't really much happening. So I and a couple of other mums got together and we started a garden and a place and we would do gardens together, we'd cook together, we'd learn language and music and we created this whole free program for the kids of the local area, not just at Crystal Waters, but beyond to come in and teach each other. So we'd find out which parents were, someone was a musician, someone was a writer, someone was a gardener, someone, and then we'd all, come together and share this and that was a fantastic experience I think to mm. to offer I don't that. remember terribly much of it but I do remember eating mulberries on the tree and singing <laughs> <songs>. <laughs> so. there was a swing in the mulberry tree you probably spent a lot of time there maybe not up the tree because you weren't the best tree climber when you're younger Unfortunately, that's changed not, which is kind of bad when you grow up in an eco village you know that's kind of like one of the uh the requirements <laughs> <laughs> but anyway the um after that, then we started something called um, Nature Kids programs where we would um, just run, like there was people who were running amazing program. Well, say, for example, we found, we discovered a, a couple of volcanologists. <laughs> and so, and we also discovered some ecological architects and some engineers who had an eco-focus. Because often the programs that Maya mentioned before we used to take around for extracurricular things just to, you know, give some more input. Um, they always seem to be pointing you down towards a avenue of that sort of supported the dominant paradigm, if you like. It was really about, you know, if you're if you're smart and academic, then that must go towards engineering yes. or yeah. And Robert. But what's wrong with that? But there was never any questions around that about how can you use your STEM capabilities to solve ecological crisis or to avert, you know, poverty and justice. And it was never with that frame. And so 
when having been exposed to some of the best programs that I could find, we stepped back and said, okay, well, here we are. We live in this eco village. We have a network of amazing educators. Let's just run something ourselves. So we did that. And we we were doing. We made everything from giant giraffes to like little and bamboo, like yes. massive. They were huge, as big as a building. Um, and it stayed up. And to like box cities, we did urban designs with cardboard boxes. We um did um like lamandra weaving and mandala things with sticks and little architectural designs of houses using like things that we found around the forest and. It was, I'm just remembering all of these now. And also we invited the Indigenous elder to come in and talk with us. Um, yeah, no, it was amazing. Yeah, so, you know, really it was identifying what were the interests of the children in the village and in the neighbourhood and just inviting people to come in and talk. And so that was kind of the grounding of this, like, what are you interested in learning, Maya? And it's like, oh, okay, great. And then like pulling in, you know, different expertise and other children who'd be interested in doing that too. And, you know, same with the boys. And I think that's a, we can do that as, as parents, as communities, if we take on that kind of community, the learning as a, as a community approach. And, and we don't need to be in an eco village. We can do that at a local park. We can do that, you know, in a, in a library. It, There's uh, so we, many spaces around that, you know, it's hidden everywhere. Like, I mean, I think one of the main things of learning for me was walking around the eco village, you know, just kind of processing everything I'd learned. But here, you know, even though I'm not in an eco village anymore, I can still find the space to do that. So I think some people that I've met here say, oh, I'm, I haven't lived in an eco village. Oh, I could never know that. <laughs> but it's it, you can find it anywhere, I think. It's. Yeah. And I think a lot of it comes through the conversations that you open. So, you know, as a as a parent or as an educator, what are the questions that we're asking? What are the frames that we're helping to shape with with the children? I think, you know, those things are interesting. But, you know, walking through um walking through campus with you, it's so fun, isn't it? We go around and say, oh, look, there's a there's the acorns, there's the mandras, like we know where all the edible things a variegated are. Variegated elm. Oh, look. <laughs> You yes. can you can take people on an edible tour. You can set set up a, mm. a, your local. No, sometimes income. I walk around and I point out like things you can just eat, and people are like, "Okay, <laughs> no <laughs> way. <laughs> Why am I paying for all my food if there's literally like a spinach plant here?" <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, and you know, just noticing that and sharing that is a way of really rippling out that knowledge. Mm. Yeah, um, Maya, I wonder if you have any any questions for me about homeschooling or unschooling or your learning journey yeah I mean I suppose you know if we're all living then we're all learning <laughs> so unschooling never really stops I suppose I don't plan to stop mine anytime soon <laughs> but yeah I guess where have you found your learning coming from oh gosh I, exactly like what you just said it never stops I you know I'm always learning more than I'm sharing and some of the things that I've loved doing lately so you know I, I mentioned earlier that I went through quite a standard schooling upbringing but it was actually in one of my final years at uni that I um I remember one of the professors saying um design is not an ends but a means to something greater and I was just like oh it just ripped off this kind of like lid of the possibilities you know and I ended up going, discovering then a place called Schumacher College and met amazing thinkers and learners from around the world. And that just inspired me forever to be in that world. So now what I, what I do to stay inspired as well is take courses with different people that are connected to that world and be helped to facilitate courses with them. So I'm really inspired by the Deep Transformation Network with Jeremy Lent, which I help moderate in there. Both Maya and I work closely with Nora Bateson, who's a systems thinker, warm data host. So we're both hosts and connecting with that. And I love doing the podcast, the opportunity to have conversations and ask questions with people and explore ideas. So the Sense Making the Changing World podcast. So continuing learning, reading, 
writing, um, but also by teaching is a really fantastic way to keep learning as well because you need to stay up to date. You need to stay fresh with things. And, you know, one of the, one of the most inspirational things of continuing learning has been raising children, you know, like to all of a sudden it's just every day what was the new spark and then following that and following the curiosity and learning together and that's been the most inspiring journey of all to really see that and to understand the possibilities and and um yeah I think that's been pretty amazing so thank you for being such an inspiration Maya. <laughs> you're welcome thank you I, I honestly couldn't have done any of this without you so thank okay. you well, it's it's such a fun thing to to do it with with um to do it as a family, you know, to go on these expeditions and to have that rich learning experience. I wanted to invite anyone if anyone had a question, but Maya or I, both of us, um, feel free to drop it into the chat or um, pop your hand up. Um, either way, we're happy to explore questions that you would like to explore. Um, while you're thinking about that, um, I, I might just want to ask you, Maya, was there any time that you were worried about uh, whether, you know, like you had this scholarship to go to what was seen as the best school on the coast and you turned it down after a year? Were you worried that you might not get into uni or, I mean, that was your I dream mean, really to get yeah. into uni, I think. I mean, ever since I was about nine, I had up on my wall, go to Oxford, <laughs> um, which, you know, I don't know whether that's going to happen or not, maybe postcode, we'll see. But um, <laughs> it was just something that I was really drawn to. So I don't think I was ever, I don't, I wasn't ever like feeling worried about it. Yeah. Honestly, it wasn't, it wasn't something that I'd even thought to worry about because I knew, oh, I'll get there, you know, I'll do anything. <laughs> And so, I think that too was yeah. something about, you know, we would always say, look, there's so many different ways to get in. We've done our Just research. Just knowing that there was an alternative pathway, yeah. I think, because I knew that you didn't have to go through the normal school system to get there. Like yeah. I'd, I'd heard of people doing it. And I was doing it myself and I'm like, this is working fine. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I think just knowing that there was so many ways to do it, it meant that there wasn't just plan A. It was like, there's so many different roads you can take. So, so there's a really good question in here, Maya. There's quite a few questions, and mm. I can see Kirsty's got her hand up. We'll come to you in a minute, Kirsty. Um, but in firstly, one of the questions, um, well, I'll just go to Michelle's first, then I'll come back to you, Janice. Um, how did you get accepted at uni at 16? Yeah, so the logistics of it, um, um I did a SAT test, which is a standard academic scholarly aptitude test um which is like an american um private test and so i needed that to get into some head start courses i was doing at uni because i thought if i pick up some head start courses that i can get into now even though it's not the full degree i can kind of i can use those to show that yes i can do uni <laughs> so, so just I, say what a head start program in case people don't know okay what that so is. head start is kind of like you can choose one subject and you just do that subject. It's kind of what unis use to go, I like this uni, I'll go there when I finish school, which you're doing through years 11 and 12. Um, so I kind of did it through two unis simultaneously and amalgamated about five subjects over that time. Um, everything from ancient history to music to urban planning. Um, I literally picked every single different <laughs> thing I could choose to try and see which ones I was interested in actually studying. Um, and then I used that and all of my extracurricular things like home youth and um, like different philosophy courses I'd done to I just put it in a portfolio and um, submitted it. And there, of course, they I think they actually had to make a policy to let me in <laughs> being 16 and um, say in accommodation at the uni, but I think just because it was like, she's not like the usual 16 year old, she's done uni before and has kind of experience of different ways of knowing and learning. So it just 
kind of worked together that way. Um, I think also a big part of it too was it wasn't just, you hadn't just gone on one path and it wasn't just about a mark. Mm. It's about you had this mark, you ha had done some university courses, you'd done a taste test of those, but you'd also signed yourself up to like the Queensland Youth Parliament and mm. dedicated to that and you'd yeah, no, that was a massive that was a massive part of it. Um yeah. that's kind of where I discovered that yes, I love politics. <laughs> um, so this sort of community service, being being an engaged youth citizen. Yeah. And that I think when you go to ANU, they really do and and other universities as well, they like to see that you are an active citizen, not just you've got a really good brain on your head, but you've actually, you're this whole person who's bringing the whole of themselves to it. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, that I think was really important that you, that you do commit to a whole lot of things and I you think, try a whole lot of stuff out. Yeah. I think one thing that was really important in that process too, on the more logistical side of it was that while I was unschooling, I was kind of making sure I was keeping up to date by just taking tests here and there to just see, yeah, I'm on the right track. Okay, I'm going to do all of this. Okay, just check I'm on the right track again. Okay, do all of that. Um, and so just kind of amalgamating all these little test scores and going, yep, I can, I can do what's needed, but I've also got this stuff too. Yeah. Not just going test score, test score, test score. Um, yeah, yeah, and I mean, the uni application process, um, in Australia, we've, um, I went, because I moved interstate, um, I had to go through the New South Wales application process, which is pretty much just uploading all these documents, my permaculture educator certificate, my permaculture design certificate. Um, and some of the courses I took didn't even have a certificate, so I had to manually like write it all out, what it was. Um, also, there's some unis that have a homeschooler policy, which are really good. The ones that don't, you have to directly um, apply through them. Um, yeah, it's, it's about picking the unis mainly, but also, um, one of my other homeschooler friends, she's doing, um, a subject through open universities at the moment, which is a really good way to do it. It's a little bit more expensive than the Head Start student, Head Starts, um, subjects because they give you a discounted rate if you're, because they want you to go to that uni, <laughs> but the open unis, they have a big array of subjects there. I was actually just talking to her mum the other night <clears throat> and um, she was saying how important it was for her that she did this PDC and the permaculture teachers for the whole permaculture educators program. She said she went through it really slowly and as she was doing it, it gave her the process of really learning how to read in-depth things and follow in-depth processes and create something and, and also being part of the perma youth, creating presentations and organising events. And it was actually through that process that she was able to get enough confidence to apply for that course. So I thought that was really encouraging. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, if you are interested in, in your under 18 joining the program, we're, you know, we'd love to have them mm -hmm. here as part and, of um, it. Ross, you don't need a permaculture certificate to join Permu. Um, we're learning in the process. We started doing it all together, trying to get our permaculture certificate. So it's more about putting it in practice than completed it next thing. So, yeah. Yeah, Bring and it, it did start as, yeah, being a way to have a, like a youth cohort to talk together. So like study buddies in a way, and then it just grew and grew and grew. Um, should we go to Kirsty and then we'll yes. come back yes. to the chat? Kirsty, welcome. Hi, sorry, I don't want to take too long. I know there's lots of people wanting to ask questions. I'm new to the unschooling journey. I've got four children, two to 12 years of age, um, and they're loving it. But I just find it's, my question is probably more for you, Ma Morag. Um, as the mother who's been to a normal schooling environment, I notice things cropping up with me trying to drive things. And I just wondered how you went with. I guess, unschooling yourself um, to get to that point where you just follow that spark and just support and facilitate that. Yeah. yeah. It's such an ongoing process. Like I, um, one of the things that I noticed, so I, I have two sons as well um, who are a, a, just two years under Maya and then five, five, another five years, seven years younger than Maya. 
the, the youngest one's never been unschooled because he's decided he wanted to go to school. He is now echoing Maya's thing. You know, he's hitting grade five. He's kind of going, why, well, you know, I want to do this. So he might actually now do something. But the middle one, when he started to come home and do schooling, um, he was home for many years. He's only just gone back in to do year 11, mostly for the social side of things, but doing really well. But in the meantime, we had this very flexible learning journey together. And I, I was worried because whenever I would try to set something, say, I think, you know, maybe we should be learning about this now. Maybe, you know, like, how about we do some, you know, sign, cos and tan stuff and all this sort of thing. And and I, we would end up both in tears, I think, when I would try to push a certain thing that was not wanted. And so it came back to this idea of project learning. What, I, what, what I've learned with my children is that rather than trying to do the scaffolding thing, we go, you know, we, you know, each year you sort of add an extra little layer of dimension, you come back around, you add a bit more, and then you add a bit more. They told me quite categorically that that was not the way to learn, that that was the most tediously boring thing to do in the whole entire world. And so, um, you know, it may, it may, you know, it does work in some contexts and it obviously works in school contexts, but trying to do that at home, that was just not going to cut it. So what we ended up doing was finding the spark again. You know, what was what was the question? What was the first question that came out of his mouth in the morning? And setting that as being like, oh, okay, that's up here. Now what do we need to explore that in your backfill? Rather than scaffolding like this, the big question that comes up then offers an opportunity to draw in all the bits that need to be responding to that question. And so it's just this simple flip of how you, how you um, address that, I found really, really helpful. Um, constantly um, being in conversation with the children as well. And I, you probably remember this by me often saying, I've never done this before. <laughs> either yeah <laughs> we're learning this together mm. and um you know let's let's try and work this out and you know it's that that sort of that honest we're here together in this learning journey and i love being here in this learning journey with you i need a bit of time to work this out as well you know see what what opportunities are available and how i could find and then just I'd always, every night, you know, I'd be researching what was the really great opportunities around this and, and go on expeditions often was the best thing with my sons, particularly, uh, I, probably for you too, Maya, but I found the expeditions where we'd go out and be learning in place, in context somewhere. And, you know, that being the spark and the, and then that was kind of, it became fun for everyone, you know, that sort of approach. But um, what I did notice too, that was when he did go back to school at different points in time, he was actually well and truly on, on par. And that the learn, being cultivated in the art of learning, that he could learn very quickly. Like, like he felt he was worried that he'd be behind, but he noticed how quickly he was able to get back up. Like he, you know, I don't know, even for you, Mai, you'd missed, what, five years of, or well, four years of French and you could just, whoop, you could drop in and get there. Look, it took a bit of effort, but you were able to sort of come in and find that. So the learning process, I think, is really important. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is something that school doesn't really teach you how to learn. It teaches you what to learn. But, yeah, the, the way of picking it up, I think, is why I've kind of done well in school is because I know how to learn it. So that, I think, came from outside school yeah yeah thanks for the great question Kirsty. good luck with your journey yeah um I just noticed in the in the chat there was a question from Julie and Sunny and um Julie's asking have you noticed my any challenges with the university system of learning I mean you've only been there a month yeah, or so, well, so far I'm actually pleasantly surprised um by how 
the subjects cross over. You'll be learning one thing in economics that completely pops up in economics. Uh, one thing in economics that pops up in philosophy and then politics. And it's because the leading thinkers in those areas know all of them. Um, I'm also studying linguistics because I want to know how these concepts are kind of said, <laughs> like why, like how we communicate these things. And I think that it all crosses over really well. And I mean, the university system is so broad and so flexible compared to schooling that you can really approach it from any way you like. And even though the assignments, the professors do have kind of structured things of what they want you to say, if you can reason it, they're more than happy to let you, you know, if you persuade them of your point, they they will let you have it <laughs> unless they're not a very good lecturer. But I find that knowing how to, like having that kind of build up to university with those Head Start courses and kind of being in touch with all these mentors beforehand, kind of already, you know, I can do this. You know, I'm a lot of people I've seen here move into it with the school mindset, but moving into it with a completely different mindset has kind of helped me connect them all together. So yeah. I'm actually really enjoying university systems, I think. That is, it is exactly what I've been trying to find. And so. I think that's really interesting that you're saying that the access to all these different mentors that you've been able to do through Ethos Fellowship and through Perma Youth mm -hmm. and through the Permaculture Educators Program, like we do connect with so many people all the time through here. So um, the other thing that we haven't mentioned is the Ethos Fellowship. Oh, we mentioned it a bit. We didn't give it mm -hmm. a name. So studying with Fritjof Capra and we bring in other scholars as well to come and talk with us. So if you... If you're if you have a, a really um, maybe a science focused or philosophy focused young person who would like to be in conversation with other interested young people around the world, please let us know. We'll be starting to open up this program again. That's been a massive part of my learning process. So yeah. yeah. So Maya's actually mostly leading that program. Like last night, I was really sick and I just could not be there to host this group. And so I texted Maya, you know, late in the day, saying, "Maya, can you host it? I'm really sorry, I can't do it." And just like that, she did it with a plum. So well done. And, you know, I think that capacity to, to step in and run events, develop up presentations, all of those things has come really strongly through these, these perma youth things. So, um, okay, let's go to a couple more questions. I, I know that we're almost very close to finishing, unfortunately. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, there's some really interesting questions in there. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, so um, any questions that we don't get to answer here, Maya and I will have a look at and we'll type a little response to when we send out the recording and the, the email. Mm. But I'm just wondering if there's a really quick um, question. Uh, I mean, I think just to summarise, the main things that I've found during the homeschooling journey of mine, unschooling journey of mine, sorry, <laughs> have it, um, is that, you know, you've got a first principle of permaculture I think it's probably my favorite you observe things and then you interact and I think that you got to absorb you got to learn and listen to different standpoints read books read the landscape and then you make something out of it like I don't know how many times you've told me my you read so many books go and make something out of it now <laughs> so I think that's been a really big thing like you can know a lot but you you've got to do something with it too and I think that has really helped me with it. Also, um, the principle of applying self-regulation and accepting feedback. Accepting feedback is a big one for me because I'm very proud of my work and it's kind of like, no, don't give me critical advice. But uh, it has helped a lot. And by kind of doing it from the outside and you know, having someone I trust kind of go over it is much better than a teacher just going, no, this is wrong. <laughs> And I think having that kind of really deep conversation about different ideas has really helped. And, you know, kind of just being able to have the space to compost ideas. And I think the main thing is to just generalize, you know, do everything you possibly can, you know, looking at how one subject fits into another, you know, patterns to details, you know, you have a look at the big picture and you have a look at the niches and you put back into the pattern. And it's just a giant web of learning that I've just, kind of got stuck in <laughs> and so yeah I think yeah yeah that's a wonderful summary thank you Maya 
And I'm really sorry that we didn't get to everyone else's questions that are here. Um, like I said, we will try to. I'm just kind of wondering whether, do you have people that you know of that would be interested in joining the Perma Youth group? Please like write in yes in the chat if you are, just to give us a bit of a sense of that. Um, the other thing is, do you have someone who you think would like to, to actually start doing the Permaculture Educators Program with you? So um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but anyone who signs up to the Permaculture course can bring for free an under 18 person with them to learn alongside. Typically, if they're over 12, they can work towards doing their own PDC and their own permaculture teacher certificate. We have a number of young people who have done that and it's been really central to their learning. Whether they're unschooled as homeschoolers, in and out of schoolers, whatever it might be, that's been really important. Um, and also to, um, there was another question, can't remember what it was now, but really I just wanted, oh, that was what it was. Um, I, would you be interested in another conversation around this topic to dive deeper? Um, so the yeses are coming in for all sorts of things. So maybe, maybe to, <laughs> that was really bad questioning, wasn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, if you'd like to, if you'd like to find out more about how I did the things I do and we kind of did a lot of theoretical stuff today but if you'd like to know the step-by-step -step thing of how to get into uni we'd love to do that too um and you know any other questions you have would be more to kind of elaborate more on that and you know if we get enough questions maybe we'll run a second one just to answer them all yeah yeah and and my how about we create a bit of a survey after this to see what people would like more of and so and yeah. also a space where you can ask more questions and then depending what happens with that that will help us to get the answer so Maya and I will work something up and get that out to you in the next day or two awesome all righty Look, thank you so much to everyone who's been here today. Thank you, everyone who was able to donate for this. Um, we're sending that across in the next day or two to support um, a whole lot of new young people to get access to free permaculture education in a refugee settlement. And we will be um, excited to follow up on all of these questions. I'm sorry that we didn't get to answer everyone's questions and comments now, but I really appreciate your engagement here and your participation here. And Thank you to Maya for coming along and sharing your experience with us. And thank you to Stacey for hosting everything in the back end. All right. Lovely to see you all. Take care and, and good night, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're calling in from. Bye.